I was very very afraid, you know, like what will be the reaction to the book might be. So there is too much celebration of violence in our culture. I don't know in destruction nowadays also. Even a very sensible thing I put on Twitter without naming any other community, something only in support of social justice, I will get trolled and even be eventually be labeled as a jihadi. I recommended City on Fire, A Boyhood in Aligarh by Zayad Masroor Khan recently. I'm going to dig deeper into this debut memoir with the author today. Zayad, uh, let me start by saying thank you so much for writing this book. I mean, thank it was personal to you, but uh, for a reader like me, it was a it was a bridge. It was a chance to connect and it was a chance to hear what you think and feel and therefore you know uh, from your story trying to get an understanding of an entire group of people an entire community so thank you for writing the book thank you so much Anuradha. these are such beautiful words and i am i'm so glad that you will read the book and were able to enjoy it and we're just hearing news reports in the past couple of days uh in up and uh, how the up administration in preparation for the kavadia pilgrimage is telling shop owners thelewalas everybody to start putting up their names right then it's very clear the idea is to identify muslim owned shops muslim owned and um, thelawalas anybody out there who is doing a little business and who happens to be muslim um, this is morally wrong this is legally wrong this is constitutionally wrong and yet for you this is not something new or uncommon is it i don't think it is like uh, i do like as growing up growing up in aligarh and i do think growing up in any muslim ghetto in aligarh if you ask any other most of the muslims who live in these ghettos like uh, like being being identified as a muslim is always been a thing you know like uh, you know it's not just that you are just an indian you're not just it it's not enough that you are a human being you know just trying to earn your living in the yeah. country so but like that if if you tell your person there is i do think like because i'm somebody who is sensitive to those things and i do sometimes even sense you know energy shifting when i tell my name to somebody else and like that is a very very minuscule uh, you know example of this you know one of my friends uh, he was i think he was caught up in a traffic accident and i got to you know uh, bring it bring him back home and uh, you know the cops were very nice i told them that i was a journalist and you know they were very nice and uh, helpful and then they asked my name you know what like where do you work and what's your name and i told them my name is yamas ru khan so exactly in that moment i could sense the energy towards me changing like i cannot define this you know but you can like i think as human beings we can sense uh, a certain kind of if somebody distrusts you somebody is hostile towards you or somebody thinks of you as the other like as i told say in the book muslims are openly told you know like okay baaki aapke bare mein sari cheeze achhi hain par aap musliman ho ye kharab hai i don't know when india turned into this you know like because uh, we have been a very very uh, you know a country which is very very respectful in our villages and you know we have been living side by side for centuries this this idea this you know that who are you and what is your religion this has never been an like this of course this has been an issue but this was not as uh, the otherization was not as much it's interesting you talk about being able to sense the energy shift uh, you write in your book that by the age of 7 i was a veteran who could sense communal tension like a pro what is the milieu that makes a 7 year old kid uh i mean you know at 7 to be able to say ki this is, might happen and you also say something else that i found very interesting that you know for you um growing up in aligarh growing up in upper court the area in which you uh, your family home was or is that you found um 
communal violence and tension is not a binary, but it is a spectrum. It's always simmering in the air. Describe that milieu in Upper Court, in Aligarh, that you grew up in, where you felt this, and which made you a pro at sensing communal tension by the time you were seven. So I would, wouldn't would say uh, uh, that I was alone in this. Like, I do think, like, if any other person he lives in a he or she lives in a you know ghetto and like a place which has a lot of religious conflict i think their senses develop according to you know the geography of the place and the political spectrum of the place so my home as i tell in the book is in the middle of a, a hindu neighborhood and a muslim neighborhood and we are in the middle and like whenever a trouble breaks out our home was always one of the dangerous spots. It has so much likelihood uh, that there will be communal violence around that place. So after some time, you know, that kind of novelty that a conflict brings, you know, the adrenaline rush goes away. After some time, it's like, okay, your people are going about their business. Okay, like, and then there are theories and humors which are flowing in there. Uh, will there be a right or not? Will there, like, like, do we have to move our shop? Do we have to close our shop from here? Like, is it there a chance? And people are debating on on, on these things, you know, like... So okay. it's almost like a very practical coping and survival uh, method. There is a riot, there can be death, there can be, there will be violence, there can be death, there will be injury, but I have to figure out and it's almost, in fact, you write about it in a very clinical, detached way, you know, and I find that perhaps that is because of what you're describing, that you have to cope, life has to go on. If you've survived that violence... Then you have to buy the anda and you have to buy the bread and you have to go to school, right? Yeah. And it's not just, you know, like I would say I was comparatively privileged. So, but I did see them, you know, like I told, talk about one of my friends, Shadab. You know, even when there was tension in there, he went to his shop and while returning, he was shot, you know, he was killed. Uh, so, like, like, even like, so I, like for me, it wasn't a danger to, you know, probably... Uh, like roam around that area. Somebody is actually going into a Hindu neighborhood where that person is has more likelihood of being killed. And like because I do think like people who lives, uh, you know, like lives, you know, on the brink of you know economic problems, you know, and uh, like they, you know, like for for many people, like you know, if they lose one day of earning in my neighborhood, one day of livelihood, yeah, one day of livelihood, they wouldn't have something to eat at home. You know, like it's a, it's a, it's even now, even in 2024, that is a reality. You know, I will not uh, say that it's, it has changed that much, but in that time, that was a reality for most of the population. Let's say around 70% of the population, if they don't go to their work, they wouldn't, wouldn't have, you know, food to feed their children. So, so they don't have that option. You know, you cannot guess. Yeah. There is something like that, you know, there is a community, sometimes you will say, okay, like, whatever the happening, I'll just go and buy my <laughs> groceries, you know. And sometimes you will start taking that risk. And that is something that which happens in conflict areas, be it like, you know, Kashmir or be it, uh, you know, like the, you know, what is happening in Gaza right now. I do think that is because after some time people, I don't know, like people sometimes want to reclaim their old life and believe that everything is normal amid whatever is going on. They want to deny the reality that a conflict and a threat of violence is present there. I don't know, like that probably gives them some hope. I do think that or probably that is a coping mechanism. So that in that way, like everybody gets trained to identify like whether a communal violence is, uh, mm -hmm. can brew up or not and, and start seeing this as a spectrum. Sometimes you are wrong. Most of the time, you know, sometimes you get those uh, vibes in the air. You, know. you have personally experienced being part of a riot, of being a possible target of mob violence. One was in Aligarh when you were uh, on your way back in your school bus going home and it's only because of Bablu, the, this guy who was running that bus that you were saved. Uh, and then again, book ended by Delhi in 2020 the riots we've all experienced i was in delhi at that time um is there any difference because the two cities they're two great cities uh but you were living in a, uh, a muslim area in aligarh 
and you had an entire community and a network which was ready with its coping and survival techniques in the case of communal violence. And in Delhi, you were renting in a place which was predominantly Hindu during the Delhi riots. Is there any difference in what you experienced in the two cities when it came to communal violence? So I'll I'll talk about the difference in Delhi and uh, the violence and communal violence in Delhi and Aligarh. So in Aligarh, like even amid all the violence that was there, like there was somebody named Bablu. Like when my bus was being attacked, that person rose up. That person fought his, you know, let's say his Hind other Hindus and you know was very vehement that this, you know, like th this will not happen under my watch. You know, you will not take out children from school bus and kill them under my watch so like the incident i am talking about when my bus was stopped by a hindu mob and somebody had pointed me out as a muslim you know and this person is a muslim let's take him this out and in that story with bablu he first tried pretending all the children in the bus were uh, hindus and then he showed his uh, locket that of bajrang bali that he is a hindu as well but he didn't let the um, he was a very bulky man very strong person he didn't let the mob open the bus and it was like a very strange thing our bus was being uh let's say stone pelted from all sides by the mob and it was a school bus there was ch just children inside and the the reason was nothing it was just some issue about a way to uh kabristan whatever mm. so that a very simple thing and people were very very emotional at that point i could see like their anger on their faces. But Bablu was, you know, like I wouldn't be here and talking and have written this book if this was not him, you know. Like I, like even if I try very hard, you know, I cannot like despise Hindus, like, you know, like there is somebody who did save my life. So there is still a sense of ethics, a still a sense of rationality and love that I could see even amid the, uh, violence in a leaguer, you know, like people are innocent, like most of the time it's some politician who's trying to convince them to gain political leverage, you know, that happens everywhere, like even a little thing. Mm. So like the diff like, but in Delhi, I could see that there was something very, very sinister. It looks too organized. It wasn't a spontaneous thing, you know, and uh, I don't know, like, because the overarching feeling was that, you know, Muslims have done something wrong and they need to be taught a lesson for protesting against the CA riots. I do see that there is a lot more acceptance of violence during these years, you know, like when I was growing up, like the violence did happen more frequently, of course, uh, but it was considered a bad thing. I never thought about, you know, like my role, uh, you know, my status as a Muslim in India even during those right neither did my parents but right now you know because it is so frequent and there is so much approval and acceptance among the masses so we do think like what is the status will muslim survive in this new india like what is will they be confined to being a second class or a third class citizen so that is a worry to every muslim if you ask if you dig deep enough most of the muslims they will be fearing or something this will be playing somewhere on the back of their minds right now. Recently on a conversation with me, our former chief election commissioner, Dr. Qureshi, uh, had told me, he said, you know, uh, and he said it in a very impassioned manner. He said that India is secular because Hindus are secular. And in the context of the new YouTube journalism that a lot of journalists and others are doing, uh, speaking up against injustice, especially meted out to Muslims, Dr. Qureshi told me, uh, the guys who are fighting this battle, uh, you know, they are Hindus. People like me, he meant a Muslim like him. We don't even have to speak out. Do you feel that it is difficult for a Muslim to speak up about injustice to Muslims? And when you speak about rights and full rights and injustices, somehow th that does not make the breakthroughs that are needed. What do you, how do you react to what Dr. Qureshi said? I think, uh, like, I do think, like, as a Muslim, when I do talk about, like, like when this book was being released, uh, I'll be honest, I was having sleepless night. And there were times I was like, okay, should I just not publish this, you know? Like, and then I'll be honest, like, I was very, very afraid, you know? 
like what will be the reaction to the book might be you know like there are there are so many muslims who are you know like people like siddiq kapan or umar khalid you know the people those who do believe in a democratic uh, india and they were just speaking their mind and there are laws like uapa which are used you know to you know especially if you are a muslim like like i do think they are applied to anybody who uh, talks about against the state you know that can be applied to anywhere but especially among muslim there is a direct fear like if somebody calls you a terrorist all your credibility goes to the whatever you know goes to the trash bin you know or the police just has to find you link you to whatever so like and i do talk about very very provocative thing in the book and which yes. which can be so i was i was very afraid i do think there is also a difference of the class here you know um, you know like you know i do know that i have some kind of i'm a journalist i do have some kind of a social capital you know okay. like somebody like mr qureshi or let's say mr sulman khushi the people i do think they have a lot more social capital uh, than me and so but but we have to also remember like there are so many muslims in india who are just picked up on flimsy charges and there are there is mohammad amir khan who spent like 14 years in jail and then he was released by the court you know for he was found innocent of a terror charge there's a book that per, that person has written so i do think uh, there is nothing new for muslims who live on the sidelines that the state will try to you know can easily try to uh, you know imprison you or like like criminalize you a person who lives in a ghetto knows that he can be very easily criminalized and this is not even about the party it this is this also happened during the congress when when there was no bjp when even when there was congress so you know like if if we do uh, like more most of the people when they look at violence they see it only as a political problem i do also see it as a cultural problem as well and just elaborate a bit more on how you see it not just as a political issue but as a cultural issue when i see aligarh or any other town in up i don't see violence as that much of a political problem it's a very much cultural problem so violence is so much steeped in our society like how do we treat our kids how do we treat our women how do we treat marginalized groups when when something like this happen the discourse is not that uh, कि हमें कोई पॉलिटिकल जीत मिल गई डिस्कोर्स ये है कि हाँ हम आ रही तो क्या गलत हो गया उसका घर ही तो जला दिया क्या क्या बात है तो लाइक पीपल आर नॉट अपॉलोजेटिक अबाउट दीज थिंग्स एंड दिस इज व्हाट पर मी इट्स लाइक इवन इफ वी टॉक अबाउट वायलेंस अगेंस्ट वुमेन तो क्या हुआ अगर किसी ने हाथ उठा दिया क्या हुआ अगर उसका हस्बैंड उस पर चिल्लाता है लाइक वर्बल वर्बल वायलेंस सो देर इज एंड इफ यू डोंट डू दीज वायर थिंग्स एंड देन देन इज द वन then is the time then when you are being otherized okay like if if you are somebody who probably listens who doesn't hit others and then is the pro, then is the person you know if you are a man somebody will say what kind of a man are you you don't know how to fight so there is too much celebration of violence in our culture i don't know in destruction nowadays also when that noida train towers fell in and yeah. so many people were assembled just to watch yeah. the towers go down you know so so i don't know like it is something much more sinister than just a political thing like i don't know which is a cocktail of social media and religious fundamentalism what is happening but we are we are becoming a society which which is celebrating violence and that i see is a very very dangerous thing north india small towns do have a violence problem in every sphere against the marginalized people who is whoever is weaker Actually, i mean you know why just north india i am in mumbai you have a little minor bumper to bumper accident you know bumper touches another car's bumper the first reaction is to get out and hit a person you know this yeah. i mean so this culture of violence it's not just a northern thing i see it uh, it's definitely a power thing and i see it play out uh, everywhere i i mean on the streets of mumbai it's very very apparent um so, but but to but to just belabor dr qureshi's point and to get you to uh, sort of answer more directly i mean i appreciate yeah, this answer, but just very directly if i were to ask you how is it more difficult for a muslim in india today to speak out about the injustices that are being meted out how difficult is it for you to get your voice heard you you spoke very clearly and anik we vocally about the dangers that you feel in speaking up but yeah. 
do, do you feel that it is only when Hindus speak up and the majority community actually takes this on as their fight that there will be justice? I do. I do think that. I do think that as a Muslim, like I do feel afraid to, you know, talk about these things and that, that if there can be public persecution, there can be police interference as well or just a call from to anybody, you know, I know, you know, even that is enough to off put, you know, somebody like me. I do. And but also other things like the first reaction is, you know, when you talk about these things, either you will be, you know, even as a journalist, if I talk about Muslim issues, people will say, oh, you this person only talks, keeps cribbing, you know, like, you know, and like there is a loss of journalistic credibility because I'm talking about my identity as a Muslim, that that kind of those things also happens, you know. Like there is state persecution and there is, of course, like if I put a single, a very, even a very sensible thing I put on Twitter without naming any other community, something only in support of social justice, I will get trolled and even be, eventually be labeled as a jihadi, you know. And that mm -hmm. is, that is something, you know, like, and you think twice, now you think twice, like if I talk about a mob lynching that has taken place, so I will eventually be, somebody will be trolling me, somebody will be saying, oh, you tagging you people or Delhi police or something, look, like this person, even if I'm sharing a verified information. So there is that much scrutiny, you know, on a very social level as well. You talk about asserting your Muslim identity in school and therefore trying to speak understand uh, uh, larger global issues like the bombing of the Twin Towers. You talk about going through a phase where you try and look at what did Osama bin Laden represent? Why did he feel compelled to do what he did? Um, you know, you talk about then joining the Tablighi Jamaat, uh, you know, and trying to come and un trying to understand what is your understanding of your religion? What do you see the role of religion in your life and being Muslim in your life? in the con not in the context of the socio political reality in india but just in terms of you and your religion and your religious identity if you are to if you were able to divorce everything else how important is your religion to you today after this journey that you have gone through which you shared with us like Anuradha, I'll be very honest. This keeps changing, you know. Like any other person, like I do think that I have a relationship with God, and uh, I do feel that. I, there are there have been times in my life where I did not have that, you know. I, but there are times in my life where I could just feel these these things in my life. So this keeps changing. Sometimes I, uh, you know, I do believe that, uh, you know. Nothing like even this book, like I'm not somebody who is, let's say, an influencer or something. Even this book is being talked about. I do see that, you know, like there are very, very unprobable chances of it becoming, you know, like people are talking about it. I do see like it wasn't only because of, I don't know, some, you know, luck and divine help or whatever that it is, you know, like uh, people are talking, people are noticing the book. I don't, uh, so this, like, I think as a child, I was more of a, let's say, ritualistic Muslim, you know, somebody who you will like, like very indistinguishable from most of the Muslims in the country. I will dare say that, you know, like this is a, uh, at the risk of getting big bets, like, um, but yeah, and in during my college years, I was, I was away from religion and I did not care that much about religion. My family knows that. My close people knows that. But I don't know, like, after, because uh, after the, you know, 2014, you know, the religiosity became such a big thing in people's discourses. So, like, because I began reading the Quran just because I had to, you know, fight the trolls who were quoting Quran out of context. So I began reading. So because and I was like, OK, like, what are they quoting? I don't I don't know anything about my religion. I was that, you know, apart from the ritual, I did not know what Islam stood for. And then I began reading Quran and translation and many things. I don't know, like, I don't know, like, until, of course, everybody can have their own perspective. There have philosophers who have gone through it. I do think it's not as it's a very liberating philosophy. It's not. It's not as if, I don't know, because it's patriarchy, most of the proponents of the 
faith are patriarchal are problematic are do bring their toxic traits into the religion so but if you look at the text it's it isn't that much of a devil it is made out to be you know and 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 compared to other religions i don't know like i at many places i did see okay like aren't other religions more problematic than this or other sex more sex than this so most islam does give property rights to women like even you know like when it was a 15 years ago like many things there are many things uh there are uh, people who might have a different opinion i don't think i think there is just too much misinformation about this and this Misinformation, and perhaps, like you mentioned, you know, the patriarchal interpretation over time in a specific cultural milieu, right? Uh, which is the Indian cultural milieu. Um, you know, even borrow from Arabs. I don't know, like, because they are the most patriarchal. You are uh, copying their rituals as you know, Indian Indian interpretations are much more liberal. For me, my religious identity is just an accident of birth. and uh, again i might get brickbats for saying this today mm -hmm. but it is an accident of birth and it is a privilege in a country where to be hindu is major uh, to be in the majority so it gives me a lot of bonuses which i didn't ask for but i'm lucky to have but it is just not a overarching part of my identity therefore i find it interesting to explore your religious identity today as a muslim is also a political statement, political statement. and what yeah. you need to make you know so the personal journey is at one level and the political journey is happening almost simultaneously today isn't it sure like and that is a very very interesting question as well like you know like and just because there is uh, so much discourse about islam you mm -hmm. know and religiosity so like there has been a certain like everybody is getting more religious and so are muslims you yeah. know uh, so then like that uh, like if if this was not a issue you know i do think most people will not even care that much about religion to be honest you know mm -hmm. like uh, of, of all religions if, of all if, religions of all religions i do see uh, so like there is you know when it said like you know when something is threatened or something is somebody you know i am fine uh, accepting most of the things like i don't know like even jangan man or bande matram but like for me as a muslim you know uh, you know i don't agree with the interpretation the whoever says it's problematic i do think you can say that but like for me as a person if somebody likes make it a issue you know you have to do this to prove your patriotism that's become a protest then then i am one of those people who will uh you know you will say these things in private who will cherish these yeah. things in private but will not say because somebody is forcing me to do so that becomes an act of let's say bullying i don't know when you're being forced to prove your patriotism and by you know doing something so symbolic uh and then you revolt against it because why should you have to prove your patriotism and i not have to prove my patriotism it doesn't make any sense yeah. right And none of those people knew about the translation of Vande Mataram. I I know I I know more about most of my Hindu friends. I know more about Hinduism than most of my Hindu friends, by the way, and more about the uh, translations of let's say Vande Mataram or Jan Ganman or even Mahabharat. You know, I know more about these things than most of my Hindu friends. <laughs> Does that make me more Hindu than them? <laughs> I'm more Indian than them. Yeah, no. It's I mean, it's what can I say? We all know how patently unfair and even ridiculous it is, right? To have yeah, to do all this. But um, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you this. Um, you talk about since we are talking about being your personal journey as being Muslim and sometimes having to make political stances. You know, for instance, I'll tell you when this hijab controversy broke out. I don't like women wearing hijab, niqab, parda, anything because as a feminist and as a woman, I think it's a sign of patriarchy. But the way it was done, I suddenly found myself saying, "No, I have to support everybody's right to wear." Uh, the hijab because you know where this is coming from it is not uh, it it didn't seem to be at that time to be about women's rights it seemed more about you know um, attacking islam right so see there are these are all the contradictions that we are all living with today isn't it during my book launch i met harsh mandar and we were talking having a conversation and it was a very beautiful thing that he said the fight is not between hindus and muslims the fight between people those who stood for fascism and 
imposition and the people those who want freedom you know that is what what is you know it can be hindu there can be muslims who can stand for uh, you know imposition fascism and as well and like there are so many muslims who are in the are bjp you know like they, they, this is strange kind of a country you know at the end of the day but like i don't know like we can just simply say that like all of us stand for creating more freedom you know and uh, you know like for everybody everybody like be it a dalit be it an adivasi and first start from the weakest sections of the society and and do and like i do think a class you know so is something that very few people talk about it limits your freedom to such an extent you know like you can't even send your children to school or healthcare so those are things that you know things which need, will will expand your freedom are good things you know things which limit your freedom whoever it is telling you to be is a bad thing it's very simple and i understood yeah like what what harshmand sahab said like it made sense to me uh, so it, we don't have to be always in the binaries of hindu muslim left right and everything we i think this binary of freedom and fascism is much more makes mo- more more sense to me writing a book is challenging okay but a memoir which is part of your life where you are very uh, candid about your processing of your realities your religion your coming to terms with everything around you your relationship with your father which was very key and the book goes beautifully from beginning and closes with that relationship that you two share and therefore the kind of muslims you are you know both of you yeah, representing two different approaches it's that arc is really quite gives that emotional undertone to the book was it a difficult process because it was personal and because it was a memoir whatever i write after that like this will remain the most challenging book to ever write for me because i had to like face a lot of my internal demons i had to revisit a lot of traumatic uh, memories you know and sometimes you have to and it's not as if those memories were not affecting my like even my relationship with my father who eventually died of cancer like writing about him and exploring my relationship with him in some time where i was the person who was not doing the right thing you know was also very very traumatic and like even uh, sometimes even just talking thinking about old times you know uh, it became i don't know like and at many times it was a very very emotional experience but eventually i don't know i am after the writing the book i did feel that i was healed of a lot of things you know mm. it was a traumatic experience while i was writing it but after i wrote it mm. i felt a lot lot lighter inside me you know it was uh, cathartic it was cathartic and like also like it is very um, sometimes you don't see your family members you know as a third person you know your mother is just your mother yeah, you <laughs> and, see the relationship you don't see the woman you don't see the person that she is the person that she is and uh, and like my brother as a person my sister as a person all of the my friends are just you know characters in a story and so you, you know at that point you're not reducing your mother to you know just being your mother now she is a woman with her own personality and the quirks of her personality you have to be but at the same time you cannot uh, if i i don't want to uh, create a figure of a reverent mother figure you know like i just wanted to represent her as she is with her faults and her beauty and all those things i think those are the things which were very difficult you know and i and had to be fair unusual. to them well. that approach is also unusual because uh, i don't think uh, you know we we tend to either portray our parents either with just great love and devotion or completely the opposite right uh, yeah, and sure, here sure. it's not that it's a spectrum again it's not a binary uh, basically zayad you can't see yeah, things so in binary i think uh, so, so i think that opened my mind to a let's say a lot of facets of human characters you know and yeah. nuances and uh, and i did start seeing world in between in between what i believed you know challenging what i strictly believed it did make me a lot more tolerant eventually uh, writing the book so because i'm trying to understand my own faults as well uh, mm. so eventually it was a tough tough thing i think also it was also a kind of a let's say 
I was time traveling at that time when I was writing the book, you know, and I do have a very good memory and uh, uh, like, uh, but like very strange things like I was listening to those songs of that time when I was, you know, I have always listened to music. So to go back to that era, era I would listen to the song that I used to listen to those at those point. Mm. So, so it was like, you know, sometimes I could like even win a, 30 year old 32 year old body i could be that five year old again you know that yeah. was beautiful that was beautiful and to understand yourself and your society in that way is i think it's a very very uh very therapeutic exercise people should write more about themselves i guess <laughs> You know, given the ghettoization, um, given the fact that social contact between um, Hindus and Muslims, especially middle classes and upwards, is absolutely nil, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have Muslim neighbors living in Mumbai. Um, uh, I, You have very few friends, you have very few colleagues, your relationships are transactional, AC service engineer is muslim you know a lot of artisans are muslims and your uh, transactions are absolutely transactional just that i'm paying you for a service and hello thank you bye bye uh, given that we are living in physical ghettos and mental ghettos where we are locked away from each other how would you propose to build bridges i think your book is and you know something in that direction okay uh, but what can we do how do people connect uh, i do think uh, because i have uh, talked a lot about these things like i do think they are very specific strategies that we can employ and other democracies like america have utilized this so america like in 1970s and 80s they built uh, like uh, residential colonies in the middle of white colonies where black people could be housed in india it's right now the exactly the opposite is happening in fact the ghettoization is improving so in that the state has to interfere to you know safeguard uh, let's say place muslims in places where they are hindus as well so that is that like it will it can only come through the state you know we as people can do the like as civil society i do believe you know like uh, we can do things like organize tours of Muslim ghettos, however st strange that might, you know, like sometimes people like a lot of Muslim, Hindus who are very afraid to come to a Muslim area, somebody should probably take them. So I took a lot of my friends, uh, Hindu friends who were like, like, let's say it's right wing and they took them to Shaheen Bagh, you know. So let them show like it, there are normal people, not people with guns, not terrorists hiding there like they're just normal people trying to fight with their rights you know so sometimes those that kind of exposure does help and that should be more uh but at the end of the day the onus lies on state and uh, you know, other like it's people like us can do you know can talk about these things but at the end of the day like you know nobody wants to listen to a let's say a preaching you know or a lecture but when you uh most of the my classmates from delhi and uh from Jami and Aligarh, most of Hindu people who have studied there. And they have, at many times I have seen, that they, they have more love for these institutions than some of the Muslim people. And and I do say like, okay, like very few of them can, like some of them still, uh, you know, like support and the, you know, BJP at times, I do think. But yeah, like they, were, they cannot, uh, be, you know, hate Muslims. I don't think they can. So I do think, uh, you know, like these institutions find... give, yeah, give that yeah. kind of atmosphere. Yeah, but so... the state, even yeah. it's the state, state has to act as the bridge. But we don't see the state. <laughs> uh, we, we see the state uh, actually wanting to preserve this status quo, isn't it? And actually oh, worsening it, it, worsening it. Worsening it. Ghettoization exactly. is so... not good for India. Like it's not about Hindus and Muslims. You know, like what kind of a country are we giving to our children? Where, you know, like, is it not good for Hindu children as well, by the way, that I keep saying that. What gives you hope? Is there any sense of hope? And if there is, where is it coming from? 
or to have a just you know this this whole thing of oh you're muslim you're pakistani go to pakistan I mean, this is the most ridiculous things that people say why would anybody have to go anywhere else if they've been born here and if they live here or even if they are not born here and they now live here if you choose to do something right and if your ancestors have been from here it's the most hurtful and the most ridiculous thing i've heard anybody say when that is the that is the surrounding that is the surround sound where do you find hope what is what gives you hope you know like when i meet people when i go to uh, let's say places which uh, where like they are not that uh, uh, rich you know like villages and i go and people are hindus and muslims are sitting side by side talking about these things and i don't know and making fun of each other together even of their differences I think that gives me hope, a lot of hope. I do think like it's the polarization is more in towns and more in cities, by the way. People are inherently, and especially Indian people are inherently, you know, very, very adjusting, you know. When somebody comes into a train compartment, people will move sideways to give them space, you know. We are naturally very, very adjusting people. And historically, we have given refuge to so many people, you know, people from different, from Tibetans, Afghanis, a lot of people. So I don't think like it's a, I don't think that pe people have a problem. There's a culture of violence. I do sense but people are not inherently, uh, let's say, full of bigotry. I do think it's an outside interference, be it through media, be it through state interference, be it through, I don't know, let's nowadays also Bollywood. You know, it's not the normal people who are spreading this. It's the people who sit in AC rooms and, you know, and who have all the power. To inform they are the ones who need to set their minds right and that's that the book was also an attempt to do this only so i do believe in the people i do believe in the essential goodness of indian people it's the it's the it's the out if they are left on their own without being trying to turn against each other they'll be do just fine that gives me hope good luck with your writing and this is a wonderful way to start thank you uh, this thank you. helps helps build bridges this helps uh, open our minds and it gives you gives us a window into your world and um, that window is very sorely needed because we are living in these sanitized little realities you know and they all get those if we are not able to interact with everybody in this in this society of ours then they are all ghettos whether it's a rich ghetto or a poor ghetto yeah. thank you Zaya. thank you thank you so much hope you have a lovely day and Thank, Thank you. you for the lovely questions. Thank you.